Let me go ahead and get started. Like the book of Daniel, where the prophet was told not to, oh, prophet was told to seal up the book, close it up, it'll be understood at a later time. The book of Revelation was not to be sealed up and not to be closed. And I think that means that God wants us to read it and understand it. In previous lessons, we've noted who wrote it, where it was written, when it was written, as well as to whom it was written. And we also noted that Jesus Christ, to whom it is written, and Jesus Christ is the central theme of the book of Revelation. And today we're going to examine the message of the book of Revelation in a level of detail, but not in great detail. It's going to be an overview. And to begin, I want to start with a high-level outline of the book of Revelation. Then I'll take it down one level and add some flesh to it and uh, take it on from there. We will go through all 22 books, 22 books, 22 chapters. Not today. We'll see how far we can get today. Like many books of the Bible, Revelation has a key phrase and a key verse. And the key phrase is found in the very first verse of the book, where it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to give, show to his servants things that must quickly take place. Those first five words, the revelation of Jesus Christ, comes from three Greek words, Apocalypsis, Yesu Christu. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The outline of the book, or the key verse of the book, is in Revelation, the first chapter, in verse 19, where it says, Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things that will take place after this. This key verse gives us an outline of the entirety of the, of the book. It breaks it apart into three sections. Chapter 1, things which are, uh, that you've seen, talks about the past. And it's in chapter 1. And in that chapter, Christ is portrayed as the glorified one. In chapter 2 and 3, the things which are, speaks of the message that he gives to each individual church, seven in particular. And in this particular pa uh, area, Christ is shown to be the present one. He walks among his churches. Section 3, verses, chapters 4 through 22, the things which shall take place after this, speaks of the future prophetically. And here Christ is shown as the triumphant one. Now let me take it down a level. That's an outline of the entire book. Chapter 1. Picture that scene with me. John is getting rather old. Ninety plus years of age. He's the last of the twelve original apostles. Still living. But he's out on this craggy island called Patmos. And he's probably brown from the sun. Because he is a prisoner there. Imagine John on a particular Sunday morning, and I emphasize the Sunday morning, where he says this, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Notice the voice has come from behind him. And John is about to turn and see Jesus. 
Now, this isn't the first time Jesus, uh, he has seen his Savior. He walked with him for three plus years. But at this encounter, it was far different than when he saw him in Galilee. This time, it is so vivid and so powerful that shortly after he turns, what he sees caused John to fall at his feet as dead. Let's read about that encounter. Revelation, the first chapter, verse 12, starting. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one, like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and, and girded about his chest with a golden band. And in his right hand, I saw seven stars. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. It is the Lord who initiated this encounter with the apostle. And he had a message to give. And he wanted John to remember the message and to put it down in writing and to send it where he told him to send it. The Lord wanted to unlock through John the end times. Sequence of events. And that's what we have in the book of Revelation. Chapter 2. John was on the island of Patmos. <clears throat> And he was com commanded to write letters to seven present-day, <coughs> excuse me, present-day churches that existed in Asia Minor. Each letter was tailor-made for that particular church. The seven churches <coughs> were seven literal churches that existed in Asia Minor at that moment. Before the apocalypse. Let me say it this way. Before John writes, before the Lord says anything to any of the things that are going to happen upon this earth, he speaks first to the church. And that's what he's doing in chapters 2 and 3. And it's like we find in 1 Peter 4.17 that judgment must begin first in the house of God. If the church isn't a good representation of the love and the faith of Jesus Christ, how can we influence the world around us? So he speaks first to the church, churches. In these letters, we find the Lord lovingly but firmly speaking to these churches. The first church, the, book at, the church at Ephesus. In many regards, this was a blessed church. It was in the city that was the largest of any of the seven cities. And Paul and Timothy and John all pastored, worked here in this particular city, in this church. It was a, a blessed church. It was like, like a mother church to many of the others. But as time went on, they became... Um, they had other priorities rather than what their first priority was. And as a result, they began to be occupied by lesser things. But Jesus mentions to this church, he says, I love your labor, your patience, your fidelity, and your endurance. But he says, I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. And this is a message that could probably be said to many churches in our world today, that we've left our first love. Smyrna, sometimes referred to as the persecuted church. Smyrna was located about 30 miles due north of Ephesus. It was also a port city, like Ephesus was.
It today is called Izmir. It's the third largest city in the country of Turkey today. This is one of two churches where the Lord hints of no compromise. And because of their fidelity with the Lord and because they followed him closely, they were greatly persecuted. And one of their own leaders, his name was Polycarp, who pastored the church here, was burned at the stake in 155 AD. There's no words of condemnation that Christ gives to this church. There's no call to repentance, as you find in five of the seven churches. Pergamum. This church is about 30 miles, 30, maybe 40 miles north and about 15 miles inland from Smyrna. This was a political set, a city and this was the headquarters of the Roman army for this territory in the Roman Empire. And the army was located here as well as the government uh, functions were in this particular city. And Christ says, I know where you live, in verse 13. He was fully aware that they were surrounded by people that, that would influence them socially, which exerted pressure on the church for the rest of to enter in with the rest of society. And he had three things to say to this church. It's true for any church, even today. He said, have a love for the truth, desire holiness, and have a willingness to repent. Thyatira, the prosperous church, the longest of the seven letters was written to the church in the smallest city. Thyatira had little political or religious significance. There was a little threat of harsh treatment for Christians there, but there was a more subtle um, temptation, if I could put it that way, that would be, and we have it today, social acceptance. The Lord commended this church for its charity, service, faith, patience, and good works. But there was something serious going on inside the city, that, inside the church, that they weren't taken care of. There was an, a lady, a woman, called Jezebel, who influenced the people inside that congregation. She was a member of it encouraging members and believers to participate in the diabolic and ungodly festivals of the city. And the call to repentance was issued to this church and they were said, do it now while you have a chance because your time of opportunity may be fleeting. The next church Sardis, the powerless church. The first church mentioned in chapter 4 is in the city of Sardis. Sardis was a commercial and an industrial city. Many of the trade routes came through this city. Some called it a dead church. The command of Christ for this church was to wake up. Wake up. It gives the impression they're almost dead. But the very fact that he calls them to repentance says they're not beyond hope. And he says, repent, because I'm going to be coming as a thief in the night. Do it before it's too late. Philadelphia, the evangelistic church. The church at Philadelphia is one of the strongest of the seven churches. 
It was a church that had a great missionary zeal and a spiritual commitment to the Lord. It was a small and poor compared to other cities, but outwardly, or excuse me, but inwardly, they were dynamic and a faithful church. Whereas in the city of, to the church that's in the city of Sardis, which is almost unmitigated censure, the letter to Philadelphia is one of unqualified commendation. Like Smyrna, this church was harshly persecuted, especially from the local Jewish synagogue, which Jesus calls in this passage the synagogue of Satan. And dis despite opposition, this church in Philadelphia was promised by God to have an open door of evangelism. And Christ promised to keep them from the trial that was to, about to become on the earth. Laodicea, the last of the seven churches. This was an area, a, a city that was um, one of the favorite retirement cities. It was a rich city. It, uh, even in the church. And this was one of the things that he talks about to this church, he Christ, is that they became materialistic. They became lukewarm as his church is, and as we know it today. But he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. So repent. But you have, still have time. At the end of chapter 3, the scene changes dramatically. It changes from earth to heaven. And John tells us that he sees an open door in heaven. And he hears a voice that says, come up here and I'll show you things that must take place after this. And as he arrives in the throne room of heaven, he is amazed at what he sees. He is overwhelmed, in fact, by the fact that he says there's 24 elders, four living creatures, and angels that number in the hundreds of millions surrounding the throne of the one who sits on it. John tries to describe what he sees, but he can't describe fully what is undescribable. John watches from a heavenly vision now, since he's been called up there, and sees how God orchestrates the things that are going on down here on earth. It should reassure us, reassure us that God is in control and that God is sovereign and his will will be carried out. The transi transition that occurs in chapter 4 shifts us to the future now. We're in section 3 of the outline. Near the end of chapter 4, we have a gr this great throng of people that are around and beings that are around the throne, praising God, shouting and praising the one who sits on that throne and, and the Lamb. And that continues on into chapter 5, in, in, the scene is still in heaven. And here we find Jesus is the central figure. He appears almost suddenly to collect out of his father's hand, what is his inheritance? Being that he is of the root of David, he is the rightful heir to the throne. Chapter 5 begins with these words. And I saw in the right hand of him who sits on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back. 
sealed with seven seals. Do you see it there? Oops. Do you see this? Okay. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And John says, because there was no one worthy, he begins to weep. But he says, one of the elders says him, don't weep, John. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed to open the scroll. But when John turns, he doesn't see a lion, he sees a lamb. And that shows the marks of slaughter. The Lamb of God, Jesus, stretches forth his hand to take the scroll from his Father's hand. And once again, like in chapter 4, heaven erupts in praise and adoration. And this time the message is, the Lamb is worthy because he has redeemed and shed his blood for all mankind. To him be glory forever and ever. That brings us to the end of chapter 5. Chapter 6. What this, what's on the screen now is going to show what uh, happens all during the time of the tribulation. And you can follow it there. Chapter 5 ends with the Christ holding the seven seals, the, the scroll with the seven seals. And in chapter six, 6, verse 1, it says, I watched as the Lamb opened the first seal. John is still in heaven, and he sees from that vantage point what happens as each of these seals are broken. It's far worse on the earth than it has ever been in human history. The Bible calls it the wrath of God. And when he opens that first seal, he sees a white horse. A person that's trying to make himself out to be the Son of God. He's riding on a white horse just like the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will in, in chapter 19. But other than riding on the white horse, there's nothing similar between this man and our Lord Jesus Christ. And this rider is the first of what we call the, first, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The seal number two when it's a broken, a rider is riding on a red horse. He will take peace from the earth, cause people to kill one another. And the word that's used for kill there is to slaughter or to butcher. Number three. When the third seal is opened, a black horse appears with the rider holding a pair of balances. This is often an indication of famine because when famine occurs, armies roughshod through grain fields and over the hills and through the valleys and grain is not, that isn't able to grow. Number four, John observes a rider on this horse, and it says, Behold, I looked, and a pale horse, or a pale green, some translations say, and the name of he who sits on it is called Death, and Hades follows with him. It's almost like he's saying this rider, this horse has two riders. 
one called death and one called Hades. Because the verses that follow say they too will bring devastation on the earth to the effect of one-fourth of the world's population are killed. In today's population, that's about two billion people. We've passed the eight billion now on, in the world. Seal number five. Once again, the scene is in heaven because John sees under the altar the souls of those that have been slain for their testimony and for their, the word of God. These are martyrs. And they're asking God, how long is it going to be until you avenge our death on those who live on the earth? And he instructs them, saying, wait a little while, there's more that are going to be killed because of their testimony, and they will join you. Verse 12, when the, <clears throat> when the Lamb opens the sixth seal, The heavens and the earth are in convulsion. The sun is blackened. The moon turned to red. The skies of the earth find stars falling through them. And the planet is shaking. Chaos ensues and the prophet and the people are calling upon the mountains to kill themselves. Rather than repent for what they've done, they're looking at nature and the mountains and the rocks to kill them and, and, and to bury them alive. And the um, strange of this is that they know where this is coming from. He says, Who's going to save us from the, lamb, from, the, from the Lamb and he who sits on the throne? They know that this is coming from God. In chapter 6, verse 14, along with this picture here, it says, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island is moved out of place. This could easily be talking about a nuclear devastation or a cosmic one as well. Things are not as we've ever seen them, what is happening here. Chapter 7. In Chapter 7, we take a, a a break, a purposeful break from the action. And we have something that doesn't add to the chronology, the narrative. The Lord helps us to understand and presents before us two different groups of people in chapter 7. It's sitting in here so that the, the chronology doesn't sp uh, continue. Why would he do that? Why would he insert this chapter? Well, the end of the previous chapter, the last verse, says this. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand? And I think chapter 7 tells us who is able to stand. With these two groups in chapter 7, we find one is fully Jewish and one is mostly Gentile. And these are representative of those who are able to stand. The first is the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel that God has selected and his seal has been put in their forehead. This tells us that God is still not through with the Jewish people on this world. 
And in this passage, the 144,000 are called the servants of God. Later in the book of Revelation, you'll find that the 144,000 will take the gospel all over this world and many people will respond. And that brings us to the second set group of people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, from all over the world. Quite possibly, they are the result of the evangelization by the 144,000. An innumerable number of people are brought into the kingdom of God, but they do so at, at their own life, and these are martyrs. Chapter 8. We've had a lot of activity, a lot of commotion, a lot of noise up to this point. But the first verse of chapter 8 says there's silence in heaven for the space of about a half an hour. Some would say it's the calm before the storm because it will get worse. At this point in the chronology, We move to the seven, the second set of seven judgments, that of the trumpets. And verse two says, the seven sealed, when he opens the, se the seal, finds seven angels, and to each of them is given a trumpet. And with their sounding, Judgment and destruction and chaos is pervasive. Trumpet number one. We are told when the trumpet sounds, there's a mixture of hail and fire and blood that come down on the earth. This judgment is aimed at Earth's vegetation because a third of the vegetation will be destroyed. The second trumpet, John describes a large fireball in the form of a mountain that falls to the Earth and causes one third of the oceans and one third of the ships to be destroyed and one third of the sea creatures to die. Trumpet number three. When the third angel sounded his trumpet, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as though it were a torch, the Bible says. Unlike the second trumpet, which caused all of the seas to be polluted, this falls on the fresh water, the rivers, the streams, the springs around the earth. Something terrible is happening on this world. Number four, in verse 12, it says that the fourth trumpet talks about the air around the earth where the sun, moon, and the stars are darkened, causing the earth to have only a third less of its light, a third less of the night as well light. The judgment of the first four trumpets that we've seen so far affects every area of our lives. But it will get worse because the next three trumpets are called three wo woes, W-O-E, woe. They're going to get bad. Three woes associated with these three trumpets are dictating the judgment that's coming upon this earth in ways that we would never accept that he describes them would ever fully understand. But I think this is a good place to stop. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, 
redeeming us through your blood. Go with us now as we leave this place. May your grace be upon us. May you empower us to be stewards of your word and, exp and exp those that will give forth the word of God. Bless this people. Bless their homes. Bless their lives. Go with them. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. We love you.